So, hey guys, I'm here with Greg Knuckles. Greg is the founder of Strong by Science and he writes for Mass Monthly Applications in Strength Sports, both services that I personally use. So, Greg, um, if you don't mind, are you happy to give a, a short introduction about yourself and then we'll get into some calisthenics questions? Oh man, I'm I'm so bad at giving introductions. Uh, yeah, my, my name's Greg. Um, I lift weights. I I write about lifting weights from time to time, and uh, yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> Can you give a background on your academic history? Uh, yeah, I've I've got a bachelor's in exercise science and a master's in exercise and sports science with a focus on exercise physiology. I I, I think is the the technical. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think those are the correct words. <laughs> right, and I'm, I'm just going to plug your services a little bit um, because I, I personally use them and I think they're they're really great for anybody interested in strength sports. Check out uh, monthly applications in strength sports or mass and also strongbyscience.com. Um, great services. <laughs> so, I certainly appreciate it. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me on. So can we start by defining strength and talking a little bit about the variables that will influence somebody's strength? Sure. So, um, yeah, I, I guess the, the most basic definition would just be the, the capacity of skeletal muscles to generate contractile force. Um, generally when people talk talk about strength, there's, there's usually some sort of function attached to it. Like if, if you wanted to get the most just direct measure of, mu of muscle strength, you know, you might put someone on a, on a isometric dynamometer and just, you know, have them try to extend their knee with as much force as possible with, you know, an arm that can't move, measure it down to the Newton, no skill required. Uh, give you a really accurate uh, view of how strong your quads are. But when, when most people talk about strength, there it's generally, uh, you know, what's your ability to generate force in a useful way to, you know, lift a certain amount of weight, move your body around in a particular way. Um, so yeah, like it's it's a it's a somewhat nebulous concept. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I think most people kind of operationally think of it as the, the ability to generate high levels of force to accomplish whatever movement you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then in terms of the factors that influence it, uh, so certainly with most ways you would go about assessing and, and measuring strength, there's going to be some sort of skill component attached to it. So, you know, if that's uh, like a, if that's like the ability to do a planche, like that requires balance, that requires coordination. If that's a one rep max squat, well, you, squats aren't the most uh, technically demanding lift in the world, but they are technically demanding lift. Like there, there is a skill component attached to that. Um, so that's certainly important, shouldn't be understated. But then beyond that, just on, on a more basic level, um, it's going to depend a lot on how much muscle mass you have cuz ultimately like your your muscles are the basic contractile units you're dealing with and if you have more um if you have more sarcomeres in parallel just more contractile units muscles going to be able to contract with more force uh another factor that's going to affect it is just how much force you can generate per unit of muscle mass which probably comes down to how tightly packed contractile proteins are within your muscles. Um, and there, there's quite a bit more variability uh, as far as that goes. So that that's called normalized muscle force. Um, and on a single fiber level, it would be referred to as specific tension. But like, like normalized muscle force and specific tension can vary like uh, plus or minus 20% as like a, a standard deviation, not like the full range. So, you know, per, per unit of muscle size, uh, someone has, if, if they're like one standard deviation above the mean, they might be 20, 25% stronger than someone who has the same amount of muscle mass, one standard deviation below the mean, they might be 20, 25% weaker than someone who has a, a similar amount of muscle mass. So there, there's, 
there's a lot more variability there than I think people appreciate. Sorry to cut you off, Greg, but on that topic, yeah. am I correct in in saying that's um, contentious whether you can actually change that through training? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, we have no idea what affects it. <laughs> um, so what I will note is that, um, yeah, so th there's this idea that is popular um, in, in just kind of like gym culture, I guess, that uh, that is going to be really strongly influenced by your training style. So if you do a lot of really heavy, low rep training, that's going to uh, relatively increase force output per unit of muscle tissue. If you do a lot of higher rep, like strength endurance type training, um, that might cause sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. You kind of dilute those, those contractile units, leads to a reduction in force output per unit of muscle size. Um, and that's, that's like a, a thing that a lot of people believe that there's like surprisingly no evidence for whatsoever. Um, so yeah, it might be true, might not be true. Um, the, the research on that topic largely isn't designed to answer that question. So the, the research essentially, so what we do know is that if you take people who are untrained and, uh, expose them to training, um, you tend to see either a, a neutral to positive effect on contractile force per unit of muscle tissue. But those, those studies generally don't use like two different training interventions to look at the effect of training intensity, rep range, whatever. Um, it, it, at least, at least the ones that, that look at like actual, like fiber contractile characteristics or that like more, that, that try to more directly assess um, like the actual density of contractile proteins within the muscles, like they, they're just not designed like that. Um, and so like what we do see is that training heavier does tend to lead to relatively larger strength gains relative to the amount of muscle that you accrue. Um, but that that's probably largely due to that skill component. Like if you, you know, if you're trying to maximize your, your one rep max squat and, you never train with a load above 60% of one RM. Like you might get good at squatting generally, but you might not be good at grinding out a max squat. So yeah, it, it's hard to say if if uh, what we observe there with heavier loads generally be, being better for maximal strength development. Uh, it, it's hard to say whether that's due to changing the actual contractile characteristics of the fiber or if that's just due to, to skill related stuff. My intuition there is that it probably is skill related changes rather than changes to your kind of contractile density. Um, because when you look at high versus low load tested with isometric um, tests, it tends to, tends to be similar, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th th that, th that's one of those things I, I considered bringing it up and I have brought it up when asked this question before. Um, but yeah, with with isometric tests, they like the the most recent meta meta analysis on the topic um, gains in isometric strength. Like the 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 mean effect did still kind of lean in favor of heavier training, but the pretty wide confidence interval, like so so p value of like 0.09 or like 0.11 or something like that, like like low but not quite at the traditional significance threshold. Um, and there also just aren't that many high load versus low load trainings that, training studies that take isometric strength measures in the first place. So it's it's uh, I, I would consider that still like a, largely an open question. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so the the actual like contractile characteristics of the muscles can influence how strong you are. Uh, and then when it comes to expressing strength. Uh, it's also going to depend not just on how much force your muscles can contract with, but also how relatively advantageous your muscle origins and insertions are for creating uh, torque or like rotational force about the joint you're trying to move. Um, and so here's, here's a little fun fact for your audience. Muscles are so much stronger than people realize. I think like the, the sheer amount of contractile force they're able to generate is absolutely absurd. So 
if you're um so let's say you can uh do a bicep curl with uh I, I guess your audience probably mostly uses kilos yeah yep okay cool so yeah let's say you can do a bicep curl uh with one arm with uh you know let's say let's say you're pretty strong 20 kilos um so okay yeah like that's uh that's that's a that's a fair bit of weight but you know that's not as impressive as like deadlifting 350 kilos or whatever so how much force could your biceps actually be contracting with to curl 20 kilos turns out a shitload of force an enormous amount so um essentially your your musculoskeletal system is is a lever system and most of those levers you're working with are tremendously inefficient for lifting a lot of a lot of weight so in general um if you want to be able to generate a lot of torque you want whatever muscle you're contracting to insert as far away from the joint it moves as possible let just just to illustrate i guess so like you know here's here's my arm and like my my bicep inserts approximately there like very very close to my elbow the length of like the distance from where my bicep inserts to the middle of my elbow joint very short if i'm curling 20 kilos it's out here in my hand and so like the distance from my elbow to my hand might be 10 times as great as the distance from my elbow to my bicep uh insertion and so if I have 20 kilos out here that I'm curling at 10 times the distance from where my bicep inserts, that means my bicep has to be contracting with 200 kilos of force, um, just, just in terms of linear force to translate to, to an adequate amount of elbow flexion torque to actually lift that amount of weight. So yeah, um, yeah, your, your muscles contract with an absolutely enormous amount of force, but, uh, to be able to then lift external loads, it also has to, like, it's going to depend on how efficient that lever system is, or in effect, how, how favorable your muscle origin and insertion points are. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, my bicep inserted, you know, a centimeter further down my arm, I might be able to curl 20% more weight. Uh, or if it inserted a centimeter closer to my elbow, even with the same amount of contractile force in my muscles, now maybe I can only curl 15 kilos. So uh, those those origins and insertion points, they don't vary that much between people on an absolute basis. But since they tend like since those internal moment arms tend to be so short, even relatively small variation can have a huge effect on how much torque uh, you can generate. And I'll also note like there there's a trade off there. Um, so human human bodies are like extremely well tuned for flexibility um so that, that that's kind of the upshot so if uh if a muscle inserts really close to the joint that it crosses that it moves what that means is that for a large amount of joint range of motion the muscles that cross that joint don't have to change in length very much um so like uh, uh shorter internal moment arms muscles that attach closer to the joints they move really, really good for flexibility, not that great for external force output. Um, and then just, just your, your general anthropometry will matter as well. So how are you built? What are your relative limb lengths, et cetera? Uh, and, and it's the same general principle here. So if you, uh, you know, if, if I have the same bicep, uh, uh, insertion point that I currently have, but my forearm was 20% shorter, well, now like the lever that bicep is working against is 20% shorter and I'll curl 20% more weight. And the inverse would be true if my forearm was much longer. So um, yeah, like that that's going to impact how much external load you can lift and therefore how we we how strong we would interpret you to be. Um, if we roughly define strength as your ability to generate muscle contractile force to do useful things. Um and yeah, like I'm sure there's probably a dozen other things that that make a little difference here or there, but those are those are the major factors. Great. There's uh, just one extra one I I'd like to talk about with you, and that's connective tissue changes to make kind of transferring that contractile force to your your bone more efficient. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I often talk about when you're trying to get strong very simplistically and um, it's a slight inaccuracy, but I often say, focus on building muscle mass in the constituent muscles and then focus on the skill of the of the task you're trying to perform. And I think that's a great kind of practical recommendation. Um, however, there, there is more to morphological changes than building muscle mass, such as your connective tissue changes. Yeah, for sure. Um, would you like me to expand on that? Cause I, I, I certainly, I would, yeah, that, that would be great. Okay. So th this is, this is something that I don't think is immediately intuitive to people. Um, especially if they've learned like a little bit about how muscles work. Um, but yeah, so your, uh, your, your muscles are composed of muscle fibers that are composed of individual sarcomeres. And when a muscle fiber contracts, each one of those little sarcomeres contracts and it pulls one end closer to the other, boom, you've generated contractile force. But then ultimately the, the question is, well, how does that force make it to your bone? Because ultimately that's what muscles are doing. They're, they're pulling on bones to create torque at a joint to help you lift an external load or move your body weight uh, in, in a particular way. Like that's, that's what they're doing. And so um, ultimately like the, those bone or the, the muscles transfer their force to bones via tendons. Like that's, that's the attachment point. And tendons are, uh, tendons are fascinating. And also like muscles and bones are, are stitched together more closely than I think a lot of people realize, but, but all of them are just, uh, enveloped by connective tissue, which is mostly composed of collagen, um, that, uh, goes around each individual muscle fiber. And then muscle fibers are bundled together into fascicles. There's more connective tissue surrounding those fascicles. And then the whole muscle is composed of many fascicles is bundled together by even more connective tissue called the epimyceum. And uh, yeah, your, your fibers themselves aren't directly inserting into the bone. Uh, they're surrounded by that connective tissue and all of that connective tissue running through your muscles comes together into just like a single mass of connective tissue at, the, at either end of your muscles. That's your tendon and that's what inserts into the bone. So the connective tissue in your muscles is continuous with your tendon and your tendon I'll note is also continuous with your bones. Like people think of bones as just like, uh, what is it? Calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, whatever the, the, they, they think of the, the mineral constituent, like the, the calcium, uh, based stuff. Uh, but your bones are like 50%, uh, like connective tissue by mass if memory serves. And it's, it's the same, it's the same stuff in your tendons. So, um, you know, it's not just like, you, you have your bone, you have your muscle, your muscle attaches to the tendon and then boop, like that's, it's just kind of like glued to your bone or whatever. Like the, the, those same collagen fibers from your muscle come together, become your tendon. And it doesn't just like kind of glue itself to the bone. It goes into the bone and is continuous with the connective tissue matrix of the bone. It's the, your whole musculoskeletal system is, is really stitched together in, I, I think, a, a very interesting and, and fascinating way. Uh, but where I'm going with all of this is, yeah, ultimately, like your muscles are generating contractile force, but uh, that makes it to the bone to create joint torques via that connective tissue, because that's what ultimately becomes the tendon. That's where the force is transferred. And so uh, as you train, and I'll also note, we don't entirely know what causes this, but essentially like your, your muscle fibers are, are kind of stuck to the connective tissue surrounding it. The, the endomyceum, the bit that surrounds, surrounds each muscle fiber, uh, at little attachment points called, uh, costumeers where there's uh, proteins on the, on the external surface of the muscle fiber that, uh, just kind of link up with that connective tissue matrix. And as you train, um, you, you just like develop more of those, more of those little points where the connective tissue is anchored to your muscle fibers. Um, and essentially what that does is it just helps that contractile force from your muscle fibers to be more efficiently transferred to the surrounding connective tissue matrix, and therefore more efficiently be transferred to the tendon. And then the bone you're trying to move generate more torque. Um, 
And yeah, so that that is another uh, adaptation to training. We don't know if it's load dependent. We know it happens for most people. Uh, and we also know that the uh, extent to which that occurs and and like your th that whole process of connective tissue development to help you be able to transfer force more more efficiently to your bones, uh, those adaptations uh, differ between people. Like some folks have, relatively large adaptations in that department. Some people have relatively smaller adaptations in that department. Uh, why? Who knows? I don't. <laughs> you know, when I started training, I used to think everyone's kind of created very similarly. And uh, if we put in more work, you know, we get, we'll get better results. And it's, it's easy to compare yourself to others and say, why aren't I getting the same sort of results for the same sort of training? Um, but I think this kind of highlights that there's a great deal of variation between people and a great number of variables that influence somebody's strength. So even if you're not progressing at the same rate as somebody else, it, it might not be due to, you know, you might be building just as much muscle, but because you have disadvantageous limb segment lengths or tendon insertion points, you might not get the same results. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Or I mean, you you may just not be building as much muscle. <laughs> the yeah, yeah. true that so, pro propensity towards hypertrophy also varies quite a bit between people. Yeah, yeah. So given that there are a, a ton of factors involved in strength, you are kind of dealt some cards with your your anatomical makeup. What can mm -hmm. we influence through training? What should I focus on to get stronger? Uh, a couple things. Um, so, I mean. You 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 can get very basic with it. Um, like you you need to build muscle to yep. <laughs> to just have more uh, have more sarcomeres in in uh, in parallel, just greater capacity for contractile force, and uh, you you need a, an element of specificity. Like you need to do the exercises that you want to get stronger at with. Uh, heavy enough loads to to build the skill required to express that strength in, in some sort of strength test. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can, you can make it uh, much more complicated, but those, those are the basics. Uh, so then when it comes to building muscle, it's uh, it's going to depend on several factors. Like, I mean, honestly, the biggest one is just, did you pick the right parents for it? Uh, but on the training side of things, uh, training volume matters a lot. So, you know, if you only do uh, uh, three sets of quad training per week, eh, if you bump that up to 10 sets per week, you'll, you'll, your quads will probably grow faster. Um, exercise selection seems to matter quite a bit. So exercises that allow you to train the target muscle uh, through longer ranges of motion or at longer muscle lengths uh, seem to be beneficial for hypertrophy. So, uh, you know, the, the difference between like a, like a quarter squat and a full squat, like the full squat is, is going to build more muscle than the quarter squat will. Um, and, uh, to some extent, uh, proximity to failure matters. So if you, you know, if, if you're using a load that you could do for 10 reps, if you just really dug deep, found that dark place and just ground out every rep you possibly could. Uh, so if you're using a weight you can do for 10 reps and you're only doing sets of three, yeah, seven reps in reserve, that's a lot. Like you're you're probably not going to build uh, much muscle on a per set basis that far from failure. Things get a little bit uh, a little bit hazier as you get closer to failure. So um, the the bulk of the evidence at this point suggests that, you know, if, if you take that set to eh, like two or three reps in reserve, so it's a load you could do for 10, and you're doing sets of like seven, eight, nine reps, not going all the way to failure, but getting pretty close, um, that probably does build as much muscle on a per set basis as, as really going all the way to failure. Um, and then uh, nutritional factors will matter as well. So you know, you'll, you'll build muscle more effectively, um, in energetic maintenance or a surplus than you will in an energetic deficit. And, uh, if you're consuming an adequate amount of protein, which for building muscle, most people will, will quote a range from a 2018 or 2016 meta-analysis by Morton and colleagues, 
uh, of of 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilo. But really, like ju- just about anything above like 1.2, 1.3 grams per kilo eh, seems to be pretty good. But if you're down closer to like a gram per kilo of protein or below, eh, you're you're probably leaving some gains on the table. Um, and then, I mean, beyond that, like like lifestyle factors will matter as well. So, you know, if you uh, if you don't sleep at all. Uh, or if um, you're you're just constantly stressed out of your mind, we strongly suspect that those things will have a negative impact on muscle growth. Um, the extent to which it's hard to say. That's a that's a difficult thing to study. Like if a if a researcher came to you and said, "Hey, we want you to enroll in this 16 week training study," but here's the kicker you're you're only allowed to sleep four hours a night for the entire 16 weeks. Um, my response would either be fuck no, like get out of my face or pull out your checkbook and like, I'll just tell you when to stop adding zeros. You know, like that's, uh, it's it's not a feasible study to do. Like yeah. pe- people, people aren't go- going to want to sign up for that study. So yeah, like it probably matters the extent to which, yeah, who can say. Um, but yeah, so th- those are, those are, those are the main factors, uh, influencing, influencing how much muscle you build. And then the, the skill component, um, that's going to depend a lot on load. Um, like if, uh, if you want to get really skilled at a particular exercise for, you know, a, a, a maximal strength test, the, the research largely suggests that like you should do at least some of your training with loads of at least 80, 85% of your one rep max. So uh, in practical terms, that tends to to come out to pretty hard sets of about two to five reps. Um, you certainly don't need to do all of your training there, but you know, at least like once every couple of weeks, you should, you should get some sets in that are, that are pretty heavy. Um, and I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing, uh, the, how frequently you practice something and how long you practice something are going to matter as well. Like, you know, you, you can, you'll get a lot better practicing a skill for 10 years than you will for a month. Um, and I kind of think that frequency of practice matters, not all that much, as long as you kind of stick with it. But if if you're like, ah, hey, I, I want to get as good at this skill as possible in the next two months, then uh, how frequently you practice it is is going to matter quite a bit. You know, if you're uh, practicing a skill three, four times per week, that's probably going to lead to a faster rate of skill acquisition than if you only practiced it once a week or once every two weeks. So yeah, can um, I add something there for um just for the calisthenics audience. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I really like that you said uh, a squat isn't that technical. It's great hearing that from a from a powerlifter because anytime I say that, I kind of get crucified online. I, I agree with you regarding frequency. You know, frequency. How, how, how the only way someone could say a squat is super technical is if they've never played another sport. Yeah, like so I, I don't. Wanna, I agree. I don't want to be learn to shoot a basketball, learn to juggle, learn to skateboard, and then we'll talk about technique, and then learn gymnastics. You know, it's another level. Yeah, like I I don't want to be too judgmental, but yeah, like as, as, as someone who has held a world record in in the squat and someone who has done a kickflip, I can tell you doing a kickflip is more technically demanding than a max squat. Thank um you. thank you Greg. <laughs> not not that a max squat isn't technically demanding. There is certainly a skill component there, but yeah, rel- relative to most things people would do in most sports. Like it's it's not it's it's nothing crazy. <laughs> so on that point I think with regards to frequency, the evidence kind of suggests it doesn't matter um, as long as you equate for volume, how frequently you train, whether it's once a week or four times Mm -hmm. a week. Um, However, I I don't know if that would really be reflected with calisthenics because I think a lot of skills in calisthenics are extremely technical. So Mm -hmm. if you take the example of a handstand push-up or a 90-degree push-up, you know, that's, that's much more challenging than an overhead press. Um, you know, handstands are, are extremely technical as they are. And then you add in this skill component of maintaining alignment and balance while you press your body weight overhead. Um, so I think when it comes to um, to strength training, I usually think 
frequency isn't such a big deal as long as volume's equated and the quality of your sets is kind of similar. But I think with calisthenics, I generally recommend a bit higher frequency uh, due to that large skill component. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm going by I'm going by what the research says on that point. But yeah, I mean mo most of the, you know you you need to be careful about generalizing the research beyond what is actually being studied. And yeah, what what's being studied most of the time is relatively lower skill exercises. Um, so yeah, like I, I would I would treat a handstand push up much more similarly to shooting a basketball. Like if 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 you want to if you want to hit forty percent of your threes, uh, there's no reason to not go out and shoot every day, or at least like four or five times a week. Um, and yeah, yeah, I I I, I assume that that uh, probably generalizes to more complex calisthenic skills. So there there are a ton of strength sports: calisthenics, powerlifting. Um, you could kind of class bodybuilding in there. One thing you see online a lot is people saying powerlifters are stronger than bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with that statement or do you think that's just a, a function of how you would test strength? I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but I think the difference is probably smaller than most people suspect. And I also wouldn't necessarily want to to chalk all of the differences up to differences in training style. Um, so yeah, when, when most people say that, they're specifically thinking, hey, power lifters can lift more in the squat, bench, and deadlift than bodybuilders of a similar size can. And it's like, well, no shit, because like that's their sport, you know, like <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know. Maybe that is maybe that isn't the most fair uh comparison. If you if you kind of move that onto neutral ground, the the most neutral ground, isometric knee extension force, baby, like, uh, or or I mean, even something like leg press strength or like dumbbell shoulder press strength or whatever. Um, yeah, like for for the three exercises that powerlifters train, they're better than bodybuilders because of course they are because that's their sport. Once you start getting into other exercises, um. The, the differences tend to be much smaller or non-existent, or in some cases, the bodybuilders are stronger. Like uh, specifically, um, like I, I think a lot of bodybuilders have like much stronger calves than powerlifters for the inverse reason. Like bodybuilders train their calves, powerlifters generally don't. Yeah. Um, or just like, yeah, like a one rep max bicep curl powerlifters don't tend to do all that much bicep training. And if they do, it's generally pretty light uh, just because they think like doing some light bicep work will help keep their biceps tendons happy from all of the benching and low bar squatting they do. But yeah, like mo I think most bodybuilders tend to have like considerably stronger biceps than most powerlifters. So yeah, it's kind of very muscle by muscle and movement by movement. I do think if you kind of averaged it across the entire body with with more fairly representative movements i think you would generally see that the power lifters still do tend to be a little bit stronger um but like i said i i don't know that i would necessarily chalk that up to training style i think that when you're talking about uh athletes in different sports and and differences be between those athletes that you observe one factor that's going to matter is certainly the training that is performed for those sports. But another factor that's going to matter is what athletes find their way into those sports in the first place. Um, you know, and it, it, it's so it, it's kind of like the, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, like like evidence based fitness professionals will very rightly uh, call people out who say like, oh, yeah, uh, dancing or yoga will give you long, lean muscles. And it's like, well, no, like dan dancers just look like that because like that's if you're if you're going to become a professional dancer, you need to have, quote unquote, long, lean muscles, because that's like what gives you the line that dance companies are looking for. Like that, that's just the aesthetic that yeah. they need. So, so like the, the sport is like selecting the look, not necessarily the sport training, giving you that look. Um, and, and I think that a lot of those same people will then turn around and say, 
Oh yeah. And, and, uh, power lifters are stronger than bodybuilders solely because of the training, which is, is the same logic as someone saying like, Oh, dancing will give you long, lean muscles. Or, or which, a more ridiculous case, basketball will make you tall. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think people realize they're applying the same logic there, but, but they kind of are. Um, the, the training definitely could make a difference. Like it, it could, who knows? Um, but I mean, also just like people who have a higher than average propensity for strength are probably more likely to find their way into the sport of powerlifting than a random person in the general population. Um, whereas like that, that's not really the case for bodybuilding. Like your, your success as a bodybuilder has nothing to do with how much weight you can lift in the gym. It's just how, how big and shredded you look on stage, you know? Um, and so there are some tremendously strong bodybuilders. There are also some bodybuilders who have huge muscles that are just like way weaker than you would expect them to be based on how they look. Um, and that, that is not predictive of how successful they are in their sport. So yeah, I, I do think power lifters do tend to be stronger, even when you just kind of like equate for things. And, um, some of that may have to do with training. Like it certainly does for the squat bench deadlift for other exercises. It may, may not. Uh, but I, I think a larger explanation is just kind of sport selection. Like who, who is drawn to what sport and what general characteristics do those people have? Selection bias is definitely a thing. You know, there's uh, basketballs tend to be tall due to selection bias. There's no mechanism mm -hmm. through which playing basketball makes somebody taller. Um, however, there, there kind of is a mechanism through which powerlifting training would enhance strength as opposed to just pure focus on hypertrophy. So it's hard to tease out. I mean, for, for squat bench deadlift, certainly, but, um, yeah, I mean, are, are powerlifters training pull downs that much different than bodybuilders do? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> I'd love to see, um, I'd love to see a study comparing it and, and see if they, you know, truly are on stronger on neutral tests. So there, there, there was, which is, which is what I had in mind. And I, uh, I don't, I don't remember the author or year, which is why I didn't cite it. Uh, but yeah, there, there is, there is a study that I have. Hmm, I think I retweeted it maybe like two years ago. If someone just wants to scroll back through my Twitter feed and try to find it. But, uh, but yeah, there, there, there was a study where they like recruit recruited similarly sized powerlifters and bodybuilders. And I think, I think had them do like dumbbell press, some sort of row, maybe leg press, like eh, a few other exercises, whatever. Um, and if memory serves for that study, there weren't statistically significant differences between the powerlifters and bodybuilders for any of the exercises tested. But I think like five of the six, like the the nominal difference still leaned in favor of the power lifters. So that, that that's kind of what I, I have in the back of my mind as I'm answering this question. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't I don't remember all of the details of that study, which is which is why I didn't cite it. Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, you know, bodybuilding doesn't have a performance aspect with regards to strength. It's really just about aesthetics and powerlifting does. So it makes sense that even if you equate for muscle mass, Perhaps, you know, powerlifters tend to have, um, you know, some of the other variables that we spoke about, such as normalized muscle force in their favor or tendon insertions mm -hmm. in their favor. One thing I want to talk about is um, biological scaling. So th this has uh, um, implications for calisthenics. Um, a lot of people seem to think, you know, lifting weights isn't really a fair measure of a fair test of strength because, you know, Greg weighs more than I do. Of course, he can lift more. Um, no weight classes in the jungle, baby. <laughs> but when it comes to um, body weight exercises, they sometimes say things like, you know, maybe chin ups is a is a better measure of um of relative strength because it takes into account your body weight. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how strength scales with size and why smaller lifters tend to be relatively stronger? Yeah, sure, uh, absolutely. So. Yeah, uh, that 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 is um, that is something you you encounter a lot uh, when yeah when 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 people kind of start getting into strength sports for the first time, uh, one of the things they'll notice is that the smaller lifters tend to 
uh, do just about every exercise with like a higher body weight multiplier than heavier lifters do. So, you know, if someone's um, like, if someone's 75 kilos, maybe they bench 150 kilos, double their body weight. And it's like, but like, no one gets like that excited about that. It's like, ah, oh, like that's, that's a really good bench at 75, but no one's just going to lose their shit over it. But then if someone was, uh, you know, 200 kilos benching 400 kilos, they would be far and away the strongest bencher of all time. Um, and it wouldn't even be close. Like, like humans aren't particularly close to that number yet. So, you know, a, a two times body weight bench press is like a, Hey, that's, that's really good, but we're not going to throw a parade about it for smaller folks. And then for bigger folks, it'd be like, Holy shit, you're the best bencher the world has ever seen. So like, where, where's that disconnect there? Um, and it largely comes down to the fact that the just like basic geometry that determines how much you weigh and the basic geometry that determines how much contractile force you can exert um, are, have different scaling powers. So essentially, um, essentially, if, if you know the volume of a person, you have a very good, you, you can guess pretty accurately how much they weigh. Um, so like, uh, your lean mass is a little bit denser than water, so a little bit denser than than uh, one gram per milliliter, and your fat mass is a little bit less dense than water. It's like 0.87 uh, grams per milliliter, I believe. But I mean, essentially, the the variation in density between humans isn't that great. And so uh, if, if you know the density of someone, you have a pretty good idea of how much they weigh. And so... Um, uh, or, or the volume, I mean, if you know the volume of someone. So how do you calculate the volume of essentially anything? Uh, you're, you're going to take measures of approximately the same scale and multiply them together three times. So, you know, in, in humans, you have height, you have breadth, and you have depth. So we're, we're three-dimensional beings. So you measure height, breadth, depth, uh, and so like essentially our, our body volume and therefore our weight scales with our general size cubed. Um, so it, it scales with the power of three. Your muscle contractile force, on the other hand, um, is independent of how long your muscles are. So what, what determines contractile force is uh, just the, the number of, of uh, sarcomeres in parallel. So that is muscle cross-sectional area. So if, if you have two muscles, like two people with muscles of the same cross-sectional area, everything else about those muscles is the, is the same, but one person is, is tall. So their muscle is just longer and therefore has greater total volume. The other person is short. Therefore, their muscle is shorter, has less total volume. The short person's muscle weighs less. The tall person has more total muscle mass for that particular muscle. But if the cross-sectional area is the same, the contractile force will be the same. Um, and so scales with muscle cross-sectional area. If you take the cross-sectional area of something, you're you're now missing the 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 breadth component. Like you're you know you're you're dealing with something in two dimensions. It's like a, a bicep, roughly circular. You know the area of a circle, pi r squared. Like that rough approximation of of cross-sectional area. So uh, contractile force scales with essentially length squared and mass scales with volume, which is a length cubed. And so um, that that sets up what, what you would call an allometric scaling relationship where, um, yeah, as, as organisms get bigger, as humans get bigger and bigger and bigger, the absolute amount of contractile force they have, the absolute amount of strength they have goes up but the absolute amount of weight they have goes up even faster. And so the, their ratio of strength to body weight goes down. Like that's, um, yeah, it's, it's not because like smaller lifters are more skillful uh, or anything of that nature. It, it's just simply that like those body weight multipliers are just are less and less in your favor as you become larger just due to basic geometry, like the, the factors that influence weight, the factors that influence contractile force just scale with different exponents. And so, yeah, relative strength goes down as, as body size goes up.
Yeah. So the the square cubed law basically. Yep. So that should um help reassure some some calisthenics guys. If you are bigger, it is harder to do skills like the you know the planche, the iron cross, the one arm chin up than if you're if you're smaller. Doesn't mean it's not achievable or not possible. Plenty of big guys out there doing it. It's just a little bit harder mm -hmm. or a lot harder depending on your size. Um, so then with that knowledge, let's say I want to get as good at the planche as possible, um, given my anatomy, should I try to stay skinny and, and focus more on, you know, the skill component, um, should I try and get jacked or should I just try to build muscle in the relevant muscles for that skill? Uh, more so the last one, um, Certainly what you don't want to do, and I'm not speaking from experience here, is you don't want to have really short arms and really muscular legs because that fucks you up. Yeah. Um, I have tried so hard to do a planche, can't even get close. And th then I did some basic testing and just realized like, oh shit, I have really short arms. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's there's just there's no way to make the physics make sense. So I I will need to co completely reshape my body to do a planche, which is very unfortunate. Um, but yeah, so uh, in, in general, um, based on what I was saying before, a natural assumption someone might have is that therefore, if they want to be if they want to maximize their relative strength. They should try to kind of maximize all of that skill stuff, but not really try to build as much muscle as possible. Um, that is a very understandable conclusion for someone to draw, but it's it's actually incorrect. So on an individual basis, generally, building more muscle will increase your relative strength because your your body is the same size. Like your skeleton is the same size. Lifting weights doesn't make you taller. It doesn't scale up your entire body. Um, like if, if your biceps get bigger, the cross-sectional area increases uh, and the total volume of the muscle and therefore the mass of the muscle scales one-to-one -one with, with cross-sectional area. Like, um, you know, the, the muscle is the same length. It kind of, uh, yeah, it, the, the whole thing gets the cross-sectional area increases. And so, yeah, the, the increase in muscle weight and the increase in muscle contractile force on an individual basis essentially scales one-to-one. -one. Uh, and also, the as you build more muscle, the total am amount of your body comprised of muscle mass, contractile tissue, useful stuff for producing force goes up. So for, uh, for like an untrained male, um, the, the total amount of your muscle mass or the total amount of your body mass composed of skeletal muscle, it's like 35 to 40%, give or take. Um, but if you lift, a, like if you train a lot, build a lot of muscle, uh, don't put on a ton of fat in the process. Um, so, you know, maintain a similar body composition while also building muscle, then your, your total body mass might be comprised 40 to 45% muscle mass with uh, some of the most jacked people who also probably use a lot of steroids, um, sometimes getting to, I mean, almost certainly using a lot of steroids, uh, might get to a place where like over 50% of their total body mass is skeletal muscle mass. And so, you know, that that's going to increase relative strength, not decrease it because, you know, your kidneys are important. Your liver is important. Um, your, your intestines are important but they're not creating contractile force, you know? And so if you're, if you're increasing the relative proportion of your mass that creates contractile force, that's, that's going to increase relative strength. So for just in general, uh, yeah, like generally larger people tend to have worse strength to weight ratios than generally smaller people, but you being of a, you know, uh, a one general size, that's not going to change that much throughout your adult life. If you put more muscle on your frame, that will increase your relative strength. Uh, but yeah, for, for a very specific skill like a planche, um, you know, uh, you're going to you're gonna want strong front delts. You're going to want strong biceps. Um, you're going to want your core to be strong. But uh, if, if you had less muscle in other areas of your body that aren't as directly involved in that skill, that will probably also 
improve your performance for, for that particular skill. I think, yeah, you definitely want to make the, the relevant muscles bigger. So predominantly the anterior delts and, and the bicep and the posterior chain to keep the, the back extended. And that, that, I, I like what you said about you, you would want to limit muscle mass in other areas. You know, having really heavy legs would make the planche a lot harder. This is kind of a meme on the internet, you know, never skip leg day. But when it comes to um, when it comes to calisthenics, skipping leg days are a really good idea if your goal is mm-hmm. purely upper body strength. Um, yeah. It's just the the kind of risk that you'll get made fun of on, on the internet. So that's something um, I think people just need to take on an individual basis. Yeah, I, I I always get a kick out of it when the Summer Olympics rolls around and uh, people who never watch uh, gymnastics watch gymnastics for the first time in four years. And inevitably, powerlifters, bodybuilders, like people interested in muscle muscular development, see the male gymnasts and see their physiques, especially the ring specialists, and just be like, holy shit, their upper body development is insane. But Ah, look, look at those chicken legs. Like it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it's like, dude, they, they intentionally have small legs. Everything they do would just be harder if they had bigger legs. That's a, that's Absolutely. a, that's a functional component of their physique for their sport. Um, you rarely see it the other way around though. You don't see people look at cyclists in the Tour de France and say, wow, those guys really need to train some upper body. <laughs> That, that is true. Like I, this is, this is biased or whatever, purely subjective. Like I, I do think that from a just general physique standpoint, big upper body, really skinny legs does just look more ridiculous than big legs, skinny upper body. Um, but, but that's just me. That That's purely subjective. And I have huge legs so that I could just be protecting my ego there. I, I think the internet tends to agree with you. Um, you know, people kind of tend to make fun of people training for beach muscles rather than mm-hmm. trying to build their legs up. So <laughs> you're not alone in that um, that opinion. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the squat, deadlift and bench press. Um, mm-hmm. I think most people like myself will train with these lifts, but we don't have a great understanding of them. You know, we're not power lifters. Um, mm-hmm. So if you'd be happy to just give uh, the, the basic way you would cue for a deadlift, and then we'll get into the weeds a bit about spinal flexion. Mm, okay. Um, so generally, so I, I'm not a, I, I'm not like a Q heavy coach, honestly. Um, I, I think that, I think that it's, it's usually like pretty easy to overwhelm, especially new lifters by just telling them like, Hey, here, here's everything your body needs to do as it moves through space under load. Uh, and, and so just do that. Um, so usually what I do if, if I'm teaching the deadlift is I'll first just get someone to, to hinge without load. Um, and uh, like for, for people with, with no resistance training experience, it, it can be kind of hard to decouple spinal flexion from hip flexion. Like most things you do in day-to-day life, if you're just bending over to pick something up off the floor, your hip flex, your hips flex, your spine flexes, like it, it just kind of, just kind of goes together. So if, if someone's never done much resistance training before, generally when they bend over to pick something up without even thinking about it, they'll flex their spine as well. So that that's just kind of a, a skill I work on uh, without any load first. It's like, Hey, slight bend in the knees, try to keep your back straight and then just, just reach your ass as far behind you as you possibly can. Cool. Now you can hinge. And then once they can hinge, usually what I'll do is, uh, do top down deadlifts. So start with like a a light weight on the bar, like maybe, maybe like 40 kilos or something. Um, yeah, or, or I mean, even less for, for untrained female lifters, but usually like 40 kilos works just fine for untrained male lifters. Um, and yeah, just, just get them to un, unrack, take a little step out and then say, Hey, you just learned how to hinge. So just do that again. And, uh, they do. And then it's like, okay, now I'll try to go a little bit lower. Okay. And then what, once they've accomplished about as much hip flexion as you'd see in the bottom of the deadlift, say, okay, for this next rep, hinge again. And now just bend your knees a little bit. Boom. Now the bar's on the floor, pick it back up. Generally that, that works pretty well for most people. Um, and that, that's usually how I 
go about trying to teach the deadlift. Um, Greg, can I um, can I interrupt just for a second? Sure. I really like what you said about not being too Q heavy. Um, and I mm -hmm. think this has a, a lot of value in calisthenics as well, because with skills like the, you know, squat, deadlift, um, handstand, push up, one arm, chin up, whatever the skill is, there are, there are so many technical cues you can give. And there are so many variations in the way that people perform the, the lifts or the exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, for, for beginners, it can just be overwhelming when you're trying to focus on five things at once. So I really like to keep the cues minimal and um, let people kind of find their own groove and people will just tend to move more efficiently uh, with practice anyway. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so yeah, uh, spinal flexion in the deadlift. Yeah. So do you, do you cue, you know, try to keep your back straight, try to keep your back neutral, or do you kind of leave that one out? Oh man. So I, I do like, that's, that's the, that, that's kind of the whole point of teaching the hinge first and trying to decouple spinal flexion and hip flexion. Um, but, oh man, as far as, as far as why that is, um, so this this could be almost like almost entirely cultural. Like I, I I came up in the sport and just like resistance training in general when the 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 general idea being put forth by people was um very much, hey, if your spine ever flexes at all under load, you're basically fucked. Like you're yeah, you're you're gonna uh, rupture a disc, like it's gonna be bad. Um yeah, never do that. Uh, so yeah. And, and it's also like that, that's one of those things where it's, I think difficult to, to get high quality research on because like you, you can do a modeling study and look to see, uh, theoretically the extent to which some degree of spinal flexion under load is going to increase force on various tissues of the spine. Um, but like, you know, that, that is, it's it's simulations it's assumptions um it's it's hard to measure those those forces in vivo as someone is actually training and then also like whether like I, I, a lot of those studies like the the takeaway a lot of people bring from them is is basically just big number scary um like if if we see oh 6000 newtons on this particular tissue that has to be bad right and like yeah maybe it is like if if someone's like total uh, uh like loading capacity for that tissue is like 6500 newtons it's like oh you're, you're getting pretty close like that that might be a little sketchy but if it's like 14000 newtons it's like oh that's probably perfectly fine and if anything might lead to to positive adaptations um so yeah like the 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 research is is sketchy i think and and it's also I mean, you're never going to get RCTs on that. Uh, imagine going to a university yeah, ethics board exactly. and say, "Hey, yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna recruit 40 subjects. I'm gonna have 20 of them deadlift really heavy with maximal spinal flexion, and 20 of them really try to limit it, and just see how many discs we herniate over the next 16 weeks." Like, no, no way. You're never gonna get anyone to sign off on that study. So, yeah, we're I, I wouldn't say flying blind, but not flying with perfect clarity. Um, so my, my understanding of the research, which like you're, you're the PT, not me. Um, my understanding of the research is that to some extent, spinal flexion is unavoidable when deadlifting, um, like your, your eyes can deceive you. And when, whenever this is actually studied and they look to see, Hey, in, in the bottom of a deadlift or, or in any movement that like has approximately the same amount of hip flexion as you'd see in, in a deadlift. Uh, everyone flexes their spine. Like it's, it's unavoidable. Um, and also my, my understanding is that people at least assume that like a ton of lumbar flexion under load, probably not a good thing. Um, and beyond that, yeah, it, everything's kind of a gray area. So yeah, I, I, as long, as long as I don't see someone's back, just like straight up looking like a question mark, I'm like, eh, you're probably fine. Uh, especially if, if they don't report any feelings of, of discomfort, pain, anything like that. Um, I'm usually not going to get too worked up about it, but I also don't 
claim that I know the answers because I, I don't think all of the answers are known. Like, I, I think all of us are kind of uh, just flying off of our own assumptions here. And uh, I also think that the that the research largely suggests that, like, individual risk of back injury is like very idiosyncratic um where like the the things you do certainly influence injury risk but much like propensity to get strong and build muscle a lot of it comes down to like did you pick the right parents for a back that's not going to crap out on you um like there, there there's been at least one twin study that i've seen where they uh, uh basically compared um monozygotic twins uh or co co colloquially known as identical twins, although they're not technically identical, uh, but close enough, whatever, where they, they took monozygotic twins, people with basically the same DNA, same family, upbringing, whatever, um, and uh, looked at twins who had gone into very different careers with different like career risks of, uh, of back injuries. And um, yeah, the, the, the odd, like, the the lifetime risk of back injury in the twin with like a high back injury risk profession was like pretty similar to the risk of back injury and like or the rates of back injuries and in the twins with like the lower back injury risk professions um so yeah like I, it's certainly the way you lift i think probably does matter but uh a, a, a lot of that risk is just like did you pick did you pick the right parents for a sturdy back um and I guess there's no way to figure that out except learning the hard way, <laughs> which yeah. might not be the best pitch to make for deadlifting. But ultimately, I mean, so yeah, like if if I see something that just like subjectively I look at and say, I think that's dangerous. Like that that looks really bad. I'll step in and say, yeah, you you should probably try to clean this up. But if uh, if the way they're lifting is within what I would consider like a pretty wide band of acceptable technique um, and, and nothing's hurting them, like I, I don't want to induce any kinesophobia. So I'm like, eh, you know, keep, keep at it as long as it feels good for you. Yeah, I, I really like that answer. And I fully agree with everything you said. Um, yeah, I, I suspect, you know, extremely heavy loads at end range flexion. Um, may be dangerous and i think the pendulum's kind of swung on social media the other way where a decade ago people used to say don't flex your spine it'll explode then some evidence came out that spinal flexion seems to be kind of unavoidable and now you kind of see the the other um extreme which is don't worry about spinal flexion um you know do what you want flex your spine all you want so, so i agree with you um you know some spinal flexion is probably fine however i also um i also tend to try to keep a neutral spine um, not so much with the the injury risk in mind, but rather just the transferability to other performance tasks. So, mm -hmm. for instance, deadlifting with the goal of jumping as high as I can, you, you know, I'll try to keep a neutral spine or a rigid spine for that because that's going to transfer to my my vertical jump. Yeah, makes um, sense. So, moving on to the squat, how would you teach a squat? Would you start with you know you should hinge your hips first or hinge your knees, and um, mm -hmm. then we'll get into um, knee valgus and butt wink. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the way I teach the squat. So, so generally if, if someone runs into, uh, like a, a fatal error in the squat, if they've never done it before, they, they tend to just want to squat on their toes. Like they go down, knees go forward, heels come up off the ground. Yeah. That, that's not going to be stable. So, uh, really the, the main skill we're, we're just trying to get is how, how to shift your weight back a little bit get your hips into the movement uh, to some extent. And so generally the first thing I'll try is um, just like getting a, a light kettlebell. So, you know, maybe like 10 kilos or something like that. Uh, have hold it in front of them. So it's, it's like a slight anterior, like offset of the weight. So they can get into their hips while still being a little bit more upright, which people tend to be more comfortable with if they haven't squatted much before. Like the the forward lean, I think, is is kind of unintuitive for new lifters. So that little weight in the front helps them be a little bit more upright as they're learning. Um, and then generally, the first thing I'll do is just say like, hey, pick your big toe up off the ground and do it again. And oftentimes that works. Um, like if, if you pick your big toe up off the ground, it's hard to then 
come up onto your toes. Like that just forces you to shift back. And then it's like, hey, we, you know, we we won't contact points with the floor. Like you're not going to do all of your reps with your big toe up off the ground. But hey, you, you see how that felt to kind of sit back into it a little bit more, more of the weight back on your heels. Okay, now just relax your big toe and try it again. Like that, that's the first thing I try. And that uh that gets the job done for I, I'd say probably like 70% of people. Um, for the ones it doesn't. Uh, then I generally get out a box and yeah, just, just work on squatting to a box, uh, while, while keeping the heels down. And, uh, then, then once that gets kind of comfortable and, and usually, um, usually if that, if that first method, just grab a kettlebell, pick your toe up, if that doesn't work, um, generally at that point, I'll combine it with a hinge. So get the box behind them say, okay, now do a hinge. I've already taught them that by that point. So, hey, like do a hinge, like torso is going to fold forward a little bit, try to keep your back straight. Okay, now you've done a hinge, bend your knees a little bit. Now you're on the box and yeah, that's that's more or less a squatting position. Now let's do it again without the box. And generally that that will produce a more like quote unquote hip dominant squat than you you'd really try to be going for. But at that point, you've taught the skill of getting down there with with your heels on the ground and, you know, being relatively stable. And then from that point, it's like, hey, yeah, just go down again and, and just try to find like shift your hips forward a little bit. Try to find a position that's a little bit more comfortable. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll generally go with with one of those two methods. Uh, do you think okay. people should focus on hinging the hip first? That's often taught, you know, hinge the hip, then the knee, or do you just let them kind of work it out? Yeah. So, so when I, when I'm teaching the squat, um, if the grab a kettlebell, pick your big toe up, if that doesn't work, like if that does work, what, whatever kind of squat, uh, squat line feels natural to them. I'm like, cool, let's just go with that. Um, when, when I go with the, the hinge and squat to a box, uh, version, I, I get them to hinge first, just because that does put them in kind of a, a hip dominant position, get the weight back on the heels. And then down from there, like they're squatting with their heels on the ground. Um, but yeah, that, that's just kind of like a, a teaching tool. Once, once someone has learned how to squat a little bit, um, I fully don't care if they break at the hips first, break at the knees first, do both at the same time. I don't give a shit. I don't think it matters. Um, there you. are, there, there are tremendously strong and successful squatters that squat all three ways. I, I just don't think it matters. I, I really like that. Um, that has a parallel to the handstand push up. A lot of coaches will say, um, you know, break at the shoulders first and then bend the elbows. And I think it's just adding complexity, um, unnecessarily just use the motor pattern that works for you and, and yeah. it'll, it'll clean itself up over time. The spinal flexion equivalent in the squat on social media is, is knee valgus. So the knees coming in or knee cave, mm -hmm. um, do you think this should be avoided? If you see it in a squatter, would you correct it? What What are your two cents on that? Oh man, this is this this is also like kind of an aesthetic thing almost. Like if, if I see really extreme knee valgus, even though I don't have a study to point to to say that's bad and dangerous, I'm like, eh. I've seen a lot of people squat a lot of weight, and I haven't seen many people squat a lot of weight for a long time with that much knee valgus. So, like, I think it's probably bad. Uh, but we're talking like pretty, pretty extreme knee valgus. Um, for the for the most part, like, I'm I'm relatively unconcerned as long as uh, as long as it's not causing pain or discomfort. The research that suggests that yeah, not not even suggest the research that shows that knee valgus is dangerous um, tends to be like a very different context than a squat. So, you know, if, if you're landing on one leg um, from a jump in a lot of knee valgus, that's that's putting a ton of force on the ACL. Like that's th that is a motor pattern that is uh, strongly associated and i think even like causally linked with uh with acl injury I, risk i think now um, that's, that's actually a bit contentious i think the um oh for, for the landing study, yeah is that is that knee valgus isn't associated with acl risk um i'll double check this before i post it mm -hmm. but 
knee valgus tends to occur after an ACL rupture has happened rather than be a, a cause of it. Yeah, I, I, I would be interested to see that. So my my understanding, which turns out maybe maybe completely wrong, who knows? Um, but yeah, my, my understanding was that for kind of like high velocity single leg stuff, so landing from a jump uh, or um, planting your, your foot and like cutting, uh, if like change of direction, that those are the sorts of movements where a lot of functional knee valgus, so not just valgus, but, but a combination of valgus and internal rotation um, seems to be a, a pretty significant injury risk. That was my understanding, which who knows? I, I'm, I'm, I, I am very interested in seeing that research. But, but either way, it's um, not too relevant to the barbell squat, the back squat. <laughs> it, it, exactly. So that, that's what I'm getting at. So even if you grant me the premise that uh, uh, your, your ACL might be at risk from landing or cutting with a single leg, a lot of valgus, high velocity, et cetera. Um, yeah, th those things just aren't present in a bilateral squat. Like you're you're moving pretty slow. Things are under control. Both legs are on the ground. Um, yeah, like it's it's a it's a very different context. Um, and uh, my understanding of the topic, like th this, is coming from a 2014 review by Hartman, I believe, um, looking at the forces on the various tissues of the knee observed during the squat. If you have healthy ACLs, it doesn't seem like the forces put on the ACLs during the squat come particularly close to a level of force that would be scary or dangerous. So, um, and, and I mean, also, I don't know, th this is, this is the lowest form of evidence, but dude, I've been, I've been coaching and lifting and in gyms for a very long time. And I've seen a huge number of lifters, especially new lifters, um, squat with a fair bit of knee valgus. I've never seen an ACL injury in the squat. That doesn't, that doesn't mean it never happens. Uh, you know, it, and I could have, uh, I could have biased observations or memories of observations. Who knows? Like human, the, the human mind is, is fail and enfeeble and, and uh, prone to all sorts of errors and biases, but I don't know, man. I've, I've just seen, I've seen so many squats with valgus and I've seen uh, exactly zero ACL injuries in the squat than I can remember. And also, um, I, I used to, I used to train at a gym that had a lot of weightlifters. Dude, weightlifters catch all of their cleans and sna in snatches in valgus. Like, well, I, I guess there, there are two different overall approaches to the catch. Like some people, some people like, re uh, receive the cleaner, the snatch with like a slightly narrower base and uh, more like abduction, external rotation, like a kind of classic squat position. And then some people receive the clean and the snatch with like a slightly wider base, um, more internal rotation, more knee valgus. But like, I, I'd say like half of Olympic lifters receive the clean and the snatch in that general position um, until very recently when, when my beautiful boy Lasha from Georgia uh, broke broke the all time clean and jerk record. Prior to that, uh, the guy who held the record since the eighties, uh, Taryn Yanko, there's there's an uh, iconic photo of him at the bottom of that world record clean as he received it with just just an enormous amount of knee valgus. And if anything, that has to be more dangerous than the squat because you know you're not just yeah yeah you're not squatting down under control like you may have misgrooved the pull a little bit, like what weight might crash on you a little bit. You're very deep in way more valgus than you tend to see in the squat. And I don't know what to tell you, man. Like there, there are plenty of knee injuries among weightlifters, but it's, I mean, it's mostly like, like uh tendinopathy related stuff. Like you, you, you just don't see like ACL ruptures and weightlifters. Like that's, that's not a common thing. Um, so yeah, like the, none of that is particularly strong evidence and I will readily admit that, but me myself as a coach, um, yeah, if I see really extreme knee valgus, like your, your knees are almost touching together midway up in the squat, I'm like, eh, I don't know why that's bad, but I do think that's bad. Maybe <laughs> I, you should do a little bit less of it, but if it's like a reasonable, like normal amount of knee valgus, I, I don't care. Um, I, I, I've seen no reason to suspect that that's bad or dangerous. Yep. <laughs> Once again, I, I fully agree. And I, I quite like that. Um, I, I think 
um, a good kind of parallel, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is symmetrical lifting. So if mm -hmm. I see someone do the bench press and they're lifting with one arm at a time, I'll, I will probably try to correct it or cue them to try to lift symmetrically. But when we look at evidence on that, um, you know, even when people appear to lift symmetrically, joint moments are different between limbs. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any evidence or sound evidence that bench pressing asymmetrically is going to cause an injury. Um, you know, asymmetry is totally normal. You see it a lot with one rep maxes. People don't grind out with their normal pattern. You'll see some asymmetry. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's something, you know, that the evidence supports we need to correct. However, I still will, will correct it as a coach. And I think with the uh, knee valgus, it's a similar thing. I don't think it's as dangerous as many make it out to be. Um, I think some degree of knee valgus is, is normal, especially when you're grinding out a one rep max. And yeah. um, But I don't think it's something that lifters are intending to do. I don't think anybody's thinking, I better better cave my knees in to get this squat up. It's just a corrective mechanism that takes place when you're grinding out a rep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, and I mean, like the, the important thing to note about all of this stuff is like, yeah, there's there's just not good research on any of this, you know, um, like it, at best we're, we're kind of extrapolating from research. That's like kind of related to these questions or you know, like, like modeling studies that are, um, like assume, like, like making pretty informed assumptions about how much force is on particular tissues, uh, in particular movements, like, but you know, we're, we're two or three degrees separated from like actual injury rates that are observed in people so yeah like we're we're all we're all just kind of shooting in the dark here um and so i i i sort of default to just like experience like i i've been doing this for a long time um and yeah like it, for for a particular amount of knee valgus or like a particular amount of asymmetry in a lift it's like hey i've i've seen a lot of successful lifters i've been around a lot of successful lifters a lot of them had a little knee valgus a lot of them had some asymmetry i just don't know many or any lifters who've been successful and healthy for a long time who had that much knee valgus or that much asymmetry so it's you know, it's a, it's a nebulous concept. It's kind of hazy. It's like, eh, in general, it's probably fine, but boy, howdy, you, you've got a, you've got a lot of asymmetry there more, more than I generally see in people who, who do pretty well. So uh, yeah, may, maybe for you, let's, let's try to clean this up. That's, that's kind of how I approach it, which probably isn't the most rigorous way, but I don't, I don't think the evidence exists to, uh, to define the most rigorous way uh, for, for these particular questions. Well, I think that's a, it's, that's a great answer. And it's, um, I guess that's what, you know, evidence-based practice is. It's that experience component. And in an absence of evidence, that's kind of all you've got. So I just assume that your answer with butt wink in the squat would be, would be similar. You guessed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and once again, I'll, I'll just chime in with my two cents there. So yeah, what, I, I don't think butt wink is is something that needs to be always be corrected. Um, however, I, I think it does make sense to avoid it in certain cases. So for instance, I'm not a power lifter. Um, I just squat to build some muscle mass and strength in my legs. And flexing the spine doesn't help with that at all. You know, if I cut yeah. my squat short and don't flex the spine, or if I flex the spine a great deal, um, it's it's not going to add any benefit to my legs. So I'd rather just, you know, cut my range to as much as I can without without flexing the spine or flexing the spine significantly and and do my squat like that. But if um if there's a small degree of butt wink, I don't think it's something that needs to be corrected and avoided. Yep, um, I'm right there with you. Regarding the bench press, and I think this one's pretty significant for the calisthenics audience because in calisthenics, in the bench press, the common cue people give is retract the shoulder blades, mm -hmm. and um and often retract the shoulder blades through the entire lift. However, in the planche, which is kind of similar to the bench press um, or planche push-up, the cue is always to protract the shoulder blades or, or push mm -hmm. forward with this hollow body aesthetic. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, the reason for retraction in the bench press and um, if you would protract at the top or not and if you think it's important? Yeah, so it's... Um... 
It, it is assumed that scapular retraction will uh, reduce your risk of shoulder injuries when training the bench press. I'm kind of agnostic about that. Um, I don't know. It might very well could. Uh, but also, like, I don't know. I've, I've trained with powerlifters for a long time, trained with bodybuilders for a long time. You see two very different styles of bench pressing, ton of retraction for the powerlifters, uh, generally not for the bodybuilders, or if, if there is, like, it's not as aggressive. Um, and in terms of like people I've seen and people I've trained with rates of shoulder injuries seem to be pretty similar. And when, when you look at the actual like literature on injury rates and bodybuilding versus powerlifting, if, if we kind of assume that those differences in bench press technique, uh, generalize to, you know, most powerlifters, most bodybuilders, and that if you assume most powerlifters and most bodybuilders bench press, which I, I think those are reasonable assumptions. Um, yeah, rates of shoulder injuries, seem to be lower in bodybuilders. So yeah, I don't know if retracting it actually does make your shoulders that much safer, but what it does do, very important for powerlifting, reduces your range of motion. Um, it, it gets your gets your shoulders further behind to the highest point of your chest. So, you know, might, might cut two inches off your range of motion. Um, and it's the range of motion at the bottom of the press, which is where you're the weakest, which is where you're trying to, to reduce your range of motion. So yeah, I mean, for, from a purely competitive reason, um, yeah, makes it makes a ton of sense for for powerlifters to retract their shoulder blades in the bench press, uh, and yeah, for for improving performance, cutting range of motion, like that's I, I think the main reason you'd want to do it. Um, and the other thing is like why you cue like retraction and to keep it retracted. I mean, especially if you're benching a lot of weight, uh, if, you, if you're trying to retract or reduce that range of motion and improve performance, I mean, once you like fully protract your shoulder blades, like the, the bench is there, you're laying on it. There's, yeah. there, there's a lot of force pushing down between your, your back and the bench. It's hard to, to re-retract your shoulder blades. Like once, once they come out, like at that point, rack the bar, the set's done. Um, so yeah, like I, I think, I think that's the primary reason why. Uh, in general, I think that's probably not ideal. Um, so if if someone said to me like, "Hey, uh, I I want to uh, build my pecs and get stronger at pressing exercises, and I am not a power lifter," um, I mean, I I'd probably tell them to just get as far as they can with push ups. Uh, like, I mean. For most people, without much training experience, like a body weight push up is pretty challenging, and there's a, a lot of little dials you can you can turn to keep push ups challenging. You can elevate your hands to extend the range of motion, then elevate your feet a little bit and your hands, so you know more of your center of mass is is above your hands, so you feel more weight. Also, have that longer range of motion. Like that's that tends to stay pretty hard for most people, and unless they get very strong. And then if they do, you can add some band resistance and, and keep it hard, you know? Um, so yeah, like I, I, in a general sense, I'm not a huge fan of the bench press uh, for, for, for most applications, unless someone's a power lifter, because then it's a third of their sport. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. One two I've heard from, from you actually in the past is people who struggle to lock out at the top you know, and they're often told to do a lot of tricep exercises. And, and your little tip was just protract the shoulder blades. Yeah, yeah. Just just let yourself kind of sink into the bench. Yeah. Protract your shoulder blades. Yeah. 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 You, you, can't, you can't do that for every rep, but for a one rep max or the last rep of a set, like it, it it does tend to give people just a just a little more juice to finish it off. I don't actually think that the the recommendations for the planche and the bench press are in conflict at all. Um mm -hmm. So with just to add a little bit to the bench press, theoretically, um, it does make sense that retraction will allow your shoulder to move a little bit more easily, a little bit more congruently with what's called scapulohumeral rhythm. So the shoulder blade and the arm bone moving together. Um, but that makes most sense at the bottom of the lift. At the, at the yep. top of the lift, it kind of makes sense to, to protract. But as a simple cue, people tend to say, you know, just hold retraction. Um, so it was really nice to hear your cue of protract at the top if you struggle to lock out. 
the and, 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 that, and that's the exact reason why for non power lifters, I, I tend to just prefer push ups because, yeah, your, your scapula can move freely. Um, and yeah, like I, I, I don't know how, uh, how like obsessive to be about scapulo humoral rhythm. Like that's, that's something that, uh, a lot of folks say is very important. A lot of more skeptical PT say, ah, the, the evidence for that, as far as injury risk go, eh, it's not as strong as people think it is. So I, I don't have, I don't have a strong opinion there. I, but I, I do think that just in general, uh, exercises that give you like a few more degrees of freedom to, just allow your body to find the positions that feel the best and most natural for it just tends to be preferable. So yeah. And you can, you can do that with a push up, bench press. You're, you're a little bit more constrained. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. Um, I think there's, there's some other reasons I I'm with you with the, the point about scapular humoral rhythm. I don't think that, um, I don't think telling everybody the same thing is ideal. You know, <laughs> I think allowing people's shoulder blades to move to, what feels strongest to them is probably better than restricting everyone to retraction. However, mm -hmm. retraction at the bottom, you know, especially with a dumbbell bench or a, a curved bar allows for more range, more stretch on the pecs that could be good for hypertrophy, but with the planche, especially in the top position. So generally with the planche, people do protraction at the top and mm -hmm. really there, it's just a desired aesthetic it just shows yeah. I can, I can hold a planche versus I can hold a planche and push tall and look good through it much like the the straight line in a handstand. And mm -hmm. what I cue at the bottom is just allow your shoulder blades to do what feels strongest. And for me, it's mm -hmm. retracting. I can touch my chest to the floor that way. Um, some people like to maintain protraction and that's fine too. That all sounds very reasonable to me. <laughs> so one thing that's big in the, the powerlifting world and it makes a lot of sense is periodization. And there are many different ways to periodize training. And um, I think the people that will find this question interesting, we'll already know a bit about periodization. Calisthenics is a little bit different because people are rarely trying to peak for a competition. A lot mm -hmm. of people are just training year round. I just want to get strong. I've got some skills I want to unlock along the way. Um, do, you, do you have any tips for them, whether they should periodize, whether it matters? Sure, yeah. So I, I think that... Um... Yeah, I, I, I don't think it would make, I, I, I don't think people interested in calisthenics would necessarily need to periodize their training. Um, but I do think there are, uh, I, I, I do think there are like diff, difficult to quantify benefits of taking a periodized approach. Um, so, so one is that like, if you have say like a, a block of training with one particular goal that's going to be a finite length of time. And then you're going to have another block of training with a different goal. So, you know, classic like hypertrophy block, then strength block. Um, I do, I do think there might be some, some benefits of kind of like it, it, it subtly gives you a sense of urgency almost where it's like, Hey, like I, I'm, I'm trying to build some muscle. I've got these four, these four months to do it. And then after that, I'm moving on to something else. So like, I really need to get after the hypertrophy stuff and and really try to make it effective in this block uh, before I move on. You know, like it it kind of, um, you know, help helps like orient your training towards a per particular goal, just just psychologically, and also yeah, just just helps maintain like a a, a bit of urgency there about it. Um, and also, I think that there's. Like th this is th this is a deeply held belief I have, with as far as I'm aware, no research to back it up. Um, but I, I think that something that increases your risk of just kind of like repetitive overuse injuries is not not just exposing the same tissues to stress over time, but like exposing the same tissues to the exact same type of stress over time, like over and over and over. Um, that could be completely wrong, but that like that, all of my observations suggest that that is the case. Um, and so like, yeah, like a, a, a periodized approach ju just kind of like helps you get around that. Like, Hey, I'm going to do this one style of training for three months. And then I'm going to tweak some variables, do another style of training for the next three months or something like that. Um, I, I don't know that that would actually improve your overall rate of progress over time. 
But I, I do think that, you know, during that second three month block of training, um, you're, you're giving your tissues a bit of a break from the exact type of stress you were doing during that first three month block. Like I, I, yeah, I, I think that for like a long training career, if your training is very monotonous, like the exact same type of stuff all the time with very little variation, which, which is what would be implied with a completely non-periodized approach to training. Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't think that's good for people. <laughs> Um, so that, and, and like I said, again, to reiterate and be very clear, there, there's no research to back that up. That's, that's just something I think. Um, so yeah, like, I, I think there are some kind of like ancillary benefits to periodization, but in terms of just like, just sheer physiology, eh, it, it probably doesn't matter all that much. Um, the research does broadly show that periodized training leads to larger strength gains than non-periodized training. But I think that that is mostly an artifact of the way those studies are designed. So like a, a classic approach would be the non-periodized group just does uh, sets of 10 with like 70, 75% one RM just goes up in weight when they can do more than 12 reps in a set or something like that. Um, and yeah, and, and then the periodized approach might do uh, four months of training at 60%, four months of training at 70%, four, or not four months, four weeks of training at 60, four weeks of training at 70 uh, or 75, and then four weeks of training at like 80, 90%, something like that. Um, and yeah, the, the periodized group sees larger strength gains, but also the periodized group had a month of training where they were training with like 80, 90% of their one RM, the other group never went over yeah. 70, 75%. Are, are you so periodization or specificity there. Right, exactly. So yeah, I'm uh I think that you should yeah, I I interpret that body of research with a with a fair bit of skepticism. Like not that the studies are bad, but just the the, the way that the that the concepts of periodized and non-periodized training are tested in the research. Um, tends to lend itself to study designs that uh, make it basically impossible to disentangle the effects of periodization versus the effects of just some training at a higher intensity. And of those two variables, I, I think the training at higher intensity is, is more important. Um, so yeah, like I, I don't think you, uh, like I, I think you can go either way. Like I, I think if someone just prefers to periodize their training, that's totally fine. Um, and I also think that if, uh, yeah, if you don't want to, you just find a style of training that really clicks with you, that that you just find very agreeable, and you don't want to tweak things, and you're you're seeing the results you want. Yeah, I don't I don't think you need to go out of your way to to periodize just for the sake of periodizing. Great, yeah, and you can even just you know without planning, um, in anticipation of anything, just change up your programming when something gets monotonous. You know, if something yeah, gets yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. And a, a really um a really nice year-round training recommendation I've I've heard from you for strength is if you want to take a year-round approach to build strength, it's do a hypertrophy program and throw in a couple of heavy, heavy doubles or heavy triples mm -hmm. once or twice a week. Um and I think this has a lot of um merit in calisthenics. Uh, however, rather than doing heavy doubles or triples, it's probably more like do a five-second planche hold or do a couple of five-second front lever attempts, iron cross attempts, whatever the skill is. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a great approach that people can take a lot from. You know, most of your training focus on hypertrophy, um, building muscle mass with the, ideally with the skills that you're trying to improve, whether that's weighted chin-ups or easy planche push-up progressions, and then also throw in some heavy attempts once or twice a week you kind of get the benefits of that undulating periodization where you've got a heavy day and a, and a, a light day. Yeah. Well, I know I've, I've kind of almost stolen two hours of your time now. So I wanted to say thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and thanks for all that you do um, independent of this interview as well. Um, do you want to let people know where to find your, your stuff online? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, for free written content, ch uh, check out strongerbyscience.com. Uh, if you prefer to listen to things uh, rather than read things, check out the Stronger by Science podcast uh, found wherever fine podcasts are distributed. Um, 
Let's see, I am part of a research review that goes out every month called MASS, which stands for Monthly Applications and Strength Sport, uh, along with uh, Dr. Eric Helms, Dr. Mike Zordos, and Dr. Eric Trexler. Um, so I think that's cool. Uh, and if you're in the market for a uh, very nice premium uh, nutrition app, check out Macro Factor. That is uh, yet 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 another uh, way that you can support the Stronger by Science empire. Awesome! Thanks for coming on, Greg. And um, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me.